There we go. So let's go find out what the heck is going on with this because it looks like they did a uh, book symposium on it. And uh, so we're going to learn something about concern, respect, and cooperation as opposed to the founder of pragmatism, which we were t just talking about. Okay. So this is the presses on concern, respect, cooperation by Garrett Coolity. Coolity from ANU. Concern, respect, and cooperation sets out what is standardly called a normative moral theory. I prefer to call it a substantive moral theory. <laughs> well, I mean, you, it's very uh, ambitious. You want your theory to be substantive, but yeah, you can call it that if you want. But okay, they do so because it covers both the normative and evaluative content of morality. It is helpful to distinguish these, and one of the theory's main aims is to explain the relationship between them. The book's central idea is very simple, that morality, thought of as comprising the ways in which a proper regard for others should be reflected in the way we respond and relate to them, consists fundamentally in three things. Alright, so here's the thing. What the hell did that just mean? Why is the way we regard... the the ways in which a proper regard for others should be reflected in the ways we respond and relate to them. So what the fuck is a proper regard for others? And then again, then what does that actually, uh, how do you cash that out? So they say first is treating others welfare as important. Having, oh, let me put this volume down. Oh, sorry. I left it up after the BRB. The first is treating others welfare as important. Having concern for them as patients whose interests we can affect. The second is accommodating their independent self-expression, respecting them as agents with their own lives to lead. And third is joining with others in worthwhile collective action, cooperating with them as partners. I mean, this already, like independent self-expression, this is of a certain sort of world where you have independent self-expression. So you've got a metaphysics here. Um, the fact that we can affect people is like, I'm going to say that's, you know, that's not a big deal. You can have concern for things that you do. Like, so you can have concern for them as patients whose interests we can affect. Yes, you can affect people. But the second is a comic, independent self-expression. That's interesting. Like, that they have their own lives. I mean, how much are our own lives affected by, like, the world and how much of it actually is us? But this is uh, already getting into some sort of metaphysics of uh, agency right here. All right, and the third is joining with others in worthwhile collective action. So how do you how do you uh, mitigate your own interests and cooperate to get things bigger things done? Okay, many theories of morality try to combine these three elements in some way, often treating one of them as primary. Broadly conceived, the welfarist tradition of theorizing about morality can be seen as offering a picture of morality that has the first of these at its core, the Kantian tradition as emphasizing the second, and the contractualist tradition as a third. So I don't know the welfarist, I guess. So yeah, but I, I, I have heard it, but I don't know it. Okay, a fourth prominent tradition, the perfectionist one, structures its theory of morality around another core idea, that morality consists in those forms of excellence in interacting with each other through which we flourish as human beings. So is that like the Bill and Ted's be excellent to each other theory? Um, or is this sort of an Aristotelian um, thing? I don't understand this. Like the welfare tradition is about can say, off picture of Mariah that has the first at score. The first is of course treating well others welfare is important. That's definitely not Aristotle. Aristotle was an asshole. It was about self in, uh, doing things according to the virtues which would be a lot of self improvement. So that's not it. The so I guess the perf like is this where we're getting the virtue ethics uh, here at the end? But I'm not sure. Like morality consists in those forms of excellence in interacting with, with each other. Like Aristotelian like uh, virtue ethics is definitely a forms of excellence. But when are they? Uh, you think it's the Aristotelian thing, Valpo? It might be. Um. Yeah, I just don't know. But, like, that's my question is, like, is that really what's going on here? And it looks like i am got, like, a, some frame drop. I apologize on that. I think it's because it is getting hot in here. Um, yeah, and so the computer is chugging. All right, so which we flourish as human beings. 
My approach is instead to treat the first three of these elements as independent foundations in a plural foundation theory of the type pioneered by W.D. Ross. These, as I see it, are three independent sources from which we derive morality's normative content. The normative reasons it gives us that bear on what we do feel, think, and say in response to each other. The forms of moral excellence emphasized by the fourth tradition can then be explained as excellent forms of responsiveness to the reasons deriving from these three sources, supplying the art, ar ar yes, the aretaic part of one's morality, uh, part of morality's evaluative content. Okay, so it's the structure here is that we're talking about. So the excellence is how of uh, what these other theories are doing so they're not actually competing with each other they're different parts of the bigger picture so this is a an umbrella theory is really what is going on here all right so umbrella theory of taking all the other like bigger traditions and saying these all come together to form uh some excellence in how we interact with each other Okay, the sense in which I claim these are foundations for morality is this. Some parts of the normative and evaluative content of moral, morality derive their moral significance from others. For example, negligence is wrong because it is a failure of, re, due, to, failure of due regard for others' welfare. One reason for being tolerant is that it enables cooperation. And self-reliance is good, at least in part, because it allows others to lead their own lives instead of having to look after you. So it derives its part in its value in part from the value of respect. Morality's foundations are the parts of its content that are not derived from other parts of its content. What? Okay, its foundations are not are just the things that are not uh, derived from other parts. In value theory, one of the things that can be meant by saying that something's value is intrinsic is that it does not derive its value from the value of anything else. The claim that morality has foundations is a generalization of the claim that some moral values are intrinsic in that sense. A generalization because it applies to the normative as well as the evaluative parts of morality's content. Foundations are, are not stopping points for why questions. It can still make sense to ask why is this foundational part of the content of morality but they are stopping points for a relative derivation of one part of the content of morality from another. Okay, this is all, like, I understand what's going on here, but basically this is just saying, I'm declaring them to be the foundational, and we can argue for this if we want to, but there's nothing really here. You cannot, like, arguing grounding and foundational theories is extremely difficult. They're basically just saying, I'm going to declare this stuff foundations like they claim foundations is this it's a sense in that you can do it if you have enough skill but like there's nothing you're not actually going to like make any knockdown theory that's just how what's going on here so they're just saying look this is how we're structuring the theory and at some point we're just going to say look you can ask why is this a foundational part of the content of morality but you're going to say these are the reasons and people in other theories could give more stories but this is the stopping point for mine that these are the reasons and this is as much as we can say about it i mean the question is what does this person do with this because there's always a certain point where you have to stop arguing like everyone can't do everything all over like all the time so you have to make concessions and the question is are the are the concessions of stopping with these things good enough that the result like like are the results good enough that everyone else would concede that this is a good way of uh organizing the world and then allowing us to stop at certain spots to get to where we get to like you have to have enough of a payoff um to you know buy their metaphysical story that you can't actually investigate the foundations more or that you have to structure your world in a certain way and you don't ask questions about why it's structured like that so that's really the only thing I get from this. Is what they're going to say after this uh, worth it to take their uh, to bite to take their metaphysics? You know, take their word for their metaphysics. Okay, one attractions of Ross's approach is that it gives us a compositional model for moral theorizing. It allows that the derived content of morality is inexhaustibly complex, but this is this 
as emerging emerging from a relatively simple set of underlying elements and compositional principles with the complexity being generated by the repeated combinations. A raw style theory builds its explanations of the content of morality from three main sources of ingredients, the foundations it attributes to morality, the principles of derivation through which morality's derived content is generated from its foundations, and the principles of interaction through which the various components of its derived content interact with each other to determine the overall moral quality of the various objects of moral assessment, actions, attitudes, persons, states of affairs, and so on. Okay, first of all, is this a good idea? Do we actually want um, a uh, complexity or a uh, what's it, a combinatoric theory of morality where we're just taking all these simple things and just multiplying them is that actually how we think morality is like I don't think that's how things are like do we actually take like atoms and multiply them to get more uh, complex moral uh, chemical like uh, molecules is that really what this is like who ever thought that was a good idea now you might think of that as a way of analyzing certain things but like that kind of makes a weird thing um because it builds as explanations of the content of morality this is the content of morality from these ingredients so you're having a combinatoric content of morality do we actually like who actually thinks this is um how morality exists is that we've recombined like so, sort of moral atoms to get like moral um molecules and built up into like moral like uh, uh cells of structure or something like really i mean maybe but like that seems like a very strong metaphor um but yeah so, in Ross's own theory, the foundational elements are prima facie duties, which as now standardly interpreted, interpreted correspond to pro tanto reasons for action. Other prima facie duties are derived from subsuming them as instances of one or more of the foundational ones, and prima facie duties, whether basic or derived, interact with each other by having different strengths or weights, the overall balance of which determines the overall moral qualities of one act one's duty proper so yeah we've got some foundational duties which we somehow these laws which we're somehow combining to get like actual uh to get actual understanding of moral qualities of one's act see this is one of my things always with uh rules or law-based system how the fuck and i'm like I, like i'm seriously oh i've never got this since i was a kid when i was thinking uh, not a kid but maybe in college how in the holy hell are we actually supposed to understand how we combine laws? Seriously. And so how are you supposed to combine laws to make make sense of these things? I don't understand that. I never did. So duties interacting with each other. It's right here. It's just right here. Duties interact with each other. Different strengths or weights. All right, so I understand that some things are more important than each other. How, how do you add these things together? They don't have, like, numbers attached to them. It drives me, uh, I've never understood this. Okay, but this is my problem with these sorts of theories. <coughs> People like them, though. What I offer, what author says, what I offer has, very broadly speaking, the same sort of structure, but with three large differences. Morality's foundations are not prima facie duties or other forms of derivation apart from subsumption, and the interaction of the derived elements is not confined to the balancing of comparative weights, but also includes forms of undermining through which one part of the content of morality can deprive another of the reason-giving force it would otherwise have had. All right, immediately I'm saying, okay, you haven't actually gotten rid of anything. You've only added stuff. That makes it even more complicated. Ross hand waves a lot. You know, I, I should cut what I'm saying a little bit. Like, cut me. These may be great theories. And they made, like I said, the real um, thing in the end, the, the, the upshot, is how good of a theory, how interesting a theory are they actually making with it? And is it worth, like I said, buying the sort of metaphysics to get their results? If they have fantastic results, maybe this is exactly what we should be doing. And maybe the hand waving can be excused in this case. I was, I've was i never been able to do it because I don't understand what... Even when I couldn't get these the more simplistic theory, this person's adding to it. 
So I don't even know how to do that. And I don't care about, like, everyone's hand-waving, like Valpo. Like, me included. I know my bullshit. Everyone knows their own bullshit. Um, but the question is, uh, is the how much hand-waving do you compare to your content that you give? So, but this is why I'm worried. I don't really have any idea what this stuff is. Okay, of the th book's three parts, the first is devoted to setting up my view of the foundations of morality. Its task is to explain what kinds of things these are, if not prima facie duties, what exactly is their content. Part two explains the forms of derivation and interaction through which the content of morality derives from these foundations. Part three then offers three extended applications of the theory. And this is what I'd be most interested in. The part three, where they actually show where uh, the content actually uh, comes out. The departures from Ross are necessi necessary, as I see it, in order to provide an adequate set of materials to account for the full content of morality. A more thoroughly Rossian theory would be too simple. If we formulated a foundational principle covering concern for others' welfare in Ross's own terms, it would look like this. We have a prima facie duty to promote others' welfare. I mean, that sounds fine. Like, this is cool. I agree with this. I mean, it'd be nice if we could all just like, you know, help each other out. But acting to promote, the author says, but acting to promote others' welfare is only one of a variety of morally important responses to it. What can be subsumptively derived from this is limited to other prima facie duties and does not cover the, fur the further content of morality, such as its evaluative content, and also invites counterexamples. If, as it appears, it can be in a bad person's interest to get bad things, then there can be parts of a person's welfare that there is no prima facie duty to promote. You know, I'm not so sure. You know, you can help bad people out and that makes them happy. And like, if you're a utilitarian, maybe their happiness is worth something and if they're not that bad, maybe it's not terrible. But like, again, it's like, what exactly are the, is the welfare? Like, I was on the uh, subway. This must have been, like, twenty early 2020. And uh, so I think people had, like, masks on, but, like, maybe it was just very early. Nothing had gotten bad with the pandemic yet. And uh, there was a guy who was drugged out. And he dropped his lighter on the floor on the subway, and, it, like, it bounced a little bit away from him. And then he, he, he was nodding off, or he, he woke up, and then, like, uh... He was looking to smoke some weed, probably in the subway, or uh, yeah, like on the train, and like nobody wants that, not even me. Uh, I definitely don't want that; it'd make a mess. But he didn't actually do it. But like, he was looking for his lighter, and I was like, I could not tell him where his lighter is. Like, I know where his lighter is because it bounced, and it's not hard to find. But he's not gonna find it because it, like it bounced, you know, just a little bit away from him. I told him where it was, and he was really appreciative. And uh, I don't remember if he tried to light up or not right there, but, you know, he was going to make a mess for everybody, but he didn't. And he was happy when I he, uh, I showed him where his lighter was. I was like, yeah, it was like just over there. And he was like, oh, OK, thank you. So it's like him not having a lighter was probably better for his welfare and better for everyone else's welfare. But it turned out um, it was OK for everybody because he didn't actually make a mess on the train that time. Yeah, so it's like, I'm not sure. Shane, in this philosophical metaphor, is the lighter stand-in for uni moral universalism? Um, the lighter was a stand-in for me helping someone out that probably would have been better off not getting helped out in that point, in that moment. Um, yeah. Shane, I saw that your uh, computer busted. I'm so sorry. <laughs> like, it's no good. The reason I have the... I got myself a new computer was my streaming setup busted and so I finally got off my butt to get a um, new computer for like my main computer and then this computer I'm using now uh, like it became the streaming computer so my old main computer became my streaming computer and uh, yeah and so like I, but I finally upgraded and that's one of the reasons I'm actually able to do some of the more fun things like I have the uh, better uh, TTS now and other things like it works quite a bit better than it used to because you know it broke so the upgrade was needed on my part i don't know how you feel about it but like yeah it does shit does happen so i'm sorry to hear that i'm oh, sorry to see that the post uh, yeah no one needs to spend an extra 90 bucks and lose like your streams that you wanted to uh get done so 
but yeah so the question but this is what i was what i was really arguing about is that interpreting rules and laws is notoriously hard i i find it to be always so confused everyone always wants the laws to say exactly what they wanted to say and nothing more and nothing less and so the idea that we have a prima facie duty to promote others welfare well that guy wanted his lighter and maybe that was probably in everyone else's on the subway car against their welfare for me to tell him where his lighter was but fuck it like you know interpreting the law and then this author is saying well you have to make it more sophisticated i'm saying no that's not possible to get laws that are specific enough to actually cover all the instances that we're going to be in the real world is more complicated than any law can cover all the instances of and so this is one of the reasons i have a disagreement with this style of a uh, reasoning okay yeah, that's exactly how I feel about this. It's, it's going, any talk of law-like stuff is the Kantian uh, influence. Okay, but that's what it is. Okay, so the author says, I therefore propose a foundational principle governing concern for welfare that seeks to remove those three limitations. It extends beyond the promotion of welfare to cover a broader range of responses of action, thought, emotion, and speech that others' welfare properly elicits. Collectively, making up what I refer to as concern. It is formulated not as a claim about the responses there is a wait, it is formulated not as a claim about the responses there is a prima facie duty to make, but the responses to welfare that are fit or called for using those terms to refer to the relation we are talking about when we use evaluative terms with suffixes like able and worthy. And so this is exactly what I was saying. So it's not a claim about duty, which is the law-like interpretation. They want to do a fit or called for that has specific things to do with um, specific action words. And what I'm saying is you're getting closer, but you will never actually get all the, the things. This is exactly what I was worried about, is that moving from uh, the bare duty to some sort of other operation is never going to cover the complexity of human life. My complaint with these sorts of... Uh, theories it's like yeah you think you're getting all of them but how do we actually show that we're getting all of them and do you really think we're getting all things in all human life i don't i doubt it okay the relation between desire and the desirable or praise and the praiseworthy okay so it's like these are how do you describe these things i don't know i mean how do you know exactly what is all the desire and desirable or what it, everything is praiseworthy who knows and thirdly, it contains an exception clause allowing for bad elements of a person's welfare that do not call for these responses. Yeah, so this was a thing. Is it praiseworthy that I helped someone on the subway find something they dropped? Yes. Was it something that was probably going to end up causing them harm because they were smoking drugs? Yes. And did anyone on the subway actually want to deal with someone else smoking drugs on the subway? No. And so this is probably one of the times when it did not call for the response. But in that one case, the guy, you know, he refrained. So it was okay. And he was probably just going to get another lighter. So no one needs that extra bullshit. Shane says, so we are abandoning the objective because it's hard and just moving to the subject because it's easier to justify. I mean, are you saying that's what I'm saying or that's what they're saying? Um, because I don't know what the moral object, like morally objective is. Like, I don't under even even understand what like, that means what the paper's saying okay um no i think they think they're being objective um all right so the result is this principle let's just see what it is w others welfare calls for promotion protection sensitivity sympathy and solidarity unless the fitness of those responses is undermined i think this is a uh, objective um so yeah so you have to it's going to be determined by the meaning of these words promotion protection sensitivity sympathy solidarity okay and i think the author probably defines all of those as carefully as they can and uh that would be an objective thing the relationship that this principle reports i call norms of presumptive fitness and being a norm generally when someone says that they call it a norm because they want it to be uh something that is objective in the world like these are the things in the world that we should be corresponding our morality to because there are that's what they are they're norms okay 
To this, the theory adds a set of corresponding claims about the foundational norms governing respect and cooperation. In the case of, in the case of respect, this foundational principle is proposed. S. Oh yeah, actually, what am I doing? For anyone that does not know, Shane is a streamer, and you should go follow him. So, <laughs> but yes, if you want to know something about history and like sociology and all those things, when Shane gets his computer parts, you will be able to go ask him on stream, and they will be excellent. Okay. All right. In the case of respect, this foundational principle is proposed, and this is what I mean. They're going to define these sorts of things carefully. Others, self-expression, calls for non-interference, listening, holding accountable, reactive attitudes, and address unless the fitness of those responses is undermined. So they're going to make an these people. This person is making an attempt to be as objective as possible. So this sort of thing, these things, are cashed out in like this sort of uh, a further uh, definition. Okay. Here, self-expression is a term of art covering all those forms of conduct that are attributable to a person. It includes acts that are the product of autonomous choice, but extends more broadly. We can have reasons to respect what someone else is doing that do not require that she has autonomously chosen to do it. These reasons, I claim, do not derive from another part of the content of morality. In particular, they do not derive from concern for her welfare. Welfare, the presumptive fitness of respecting a person's self-expression is morally fundamental alongside presumptive fitness of promoting her welfare. But again, these there are exceptions. Not every form of self-expression is respect worthy. The norms governing cooperation are summed up in two further two further foundational principles. The first is C plus. Worthwhile collect worthwhile collective action co Ugh. Action calls for acting to initiate it, join it, collective thinking, sharing responsibility, pride, and advocacy. The collective actions this refers to are broadly interpreted, and a collective action is worthwhile when there are sufficient reasons for us collectively to perform it. The simple thought that C plus seeks to sharpen is that one basic form of moral decency Performing just as basic as attaching importance to others' interests or respecting them as people with their own lives to lead is the disposition to see the reasons there are for us to do something worthwhile together as reasons for you to participate in our doing so. Yeah, so basically they're saying it's going to be objective. Like this is, again, another objective thing. It's going to be objectively worthwhile for groups to do it, and therefore it is objectively worthwhile for us to join a group in order to do it. This time, there is no ex exception condition. Oh, interesting. WNS need an exception because a person's welfare or self-expression can be bad, but a collective action that is worthwhile cannot be bad. Bad collective actions are the subject of the counterpart principle. C minus. Badly directive collective actions calls for prevention, not joining in, collective thinking, sharing responsibility, shame, and denunciation. Okay. Um, I guess that, I mean, that that's fine. Either you join into a good cause or you uh, shun a bad cause, basically. But um, how, why are collective actions then not just big, um, big terms of like, uh, what was the one that was uh, self-expression? Why are collective actions not just larger forms of self-expression? Would those would self-expression just be um well i agree shane that just using like uh suffixes is not really gonna do it but i mean this is a philosopher i'm sure they're gonna make it re as close to it as possible they're gonna say well we're covering all the uh as many of the cases as they can but i don't get the sense that they're trying to be subjective about it because this is like right here like this c plus and c minus worthwhile collective actions and badly ones they don't want anything subjective about they're basically calling it all out saying look there is no exception condition so again i think um they're trying to be objective here as as hard as they can um because if it was subjective, then you could say, then look, there you could be wrong because um, there is a uh, self-expression there that maybe you don't understand or something. But the, these collective action things are not, uh, there are no exceptions. There are no uh, exceptions to how you treat someone's welfare or self-expression because people can, you know, treat themselves badly or express themselves badly. But that's not what you can do in groups. 
those are somehow completely objective. Okay. When a collect collective action is merely pointless or incompetent, it is sufficient to say that it is not worthwhile. Therefore, it does not call for the responses in C+. But when it is directed towards ends that are morally bad, it calls for the opposite response. You see that? Look at that crap. Like, they're immediately just calling out the thing they're saying. It's that is morally bad. Okay. Yeah. I think that's exactly right that you can actually make the determine objectively that certain things fit with the moral correctness um which uh, like I said I, I don't buy this sort of theory this is not my this theory is not for me but like that's okay people like this because as I was saying earlier if you can get the sort of responses the sort of conclusions you want and people respond to it in the right way maybe like this is a good foundation to look at in terms of like other theories should be shooting for this sort of a thing because this is what sometimes happens in different areas of philosophy you might get the right answer even if you disagree with the uh, methodology so you just, like the right uh, you got the right answer with the wrong reasons but like the fact that they get the right answer might be enough to give this theory a look I just don't know okay vindicating these claims the principal claims in part one is a matter of demonstrating the explanatory adequacy of a theory with these foundations showing that it can make sense of the full content of morality and this is what i'm saying they might be able to pull off more than we realize right here they show that it can make sense of the full content of morality and that would be impressive okay on the face of it, these four principles may seem an unpromising basis from which to work. Can the full content and nuance of morality be derived from just four principles? And how can exception hedge principles like W and S really be a foundation from which the rest of the content of morality can be derived? To apply principles like these, we need to be told what their exception conditions are and are not triggered, and whenever whatever determines that must it see and whatever determines that must it seems occupy a more fundamental level within the theory so yeah like i said i didn't think this person was stupid like they they know what they're doing here like the this philosopher so like they they're realizing they have to show out now Okay, the overall aim of part two is to supply the materials with which to address those two worries. In response to the first, I agree that the full content of morality cannot be derived from these four foundational principles if derivation is limited to the subsumptive form recognized by Ross. But derivation can take other forms. There are further kinds of subsumption as well as non-subsumptive derivation relations of enabling and responsiveness. Okay, so again, they're, what they're doing is they're building in new forms of reasoning that go along with their theory. So I don't know if that's a good idea, but that's what they're doing. Like, if you can think in these ways, then you can understand what the theory means. But again, this is a limiting factor. You have to think in the right ways. Whatever the hell non-subsumptive derivation relations of enabling and responsiveness are. Okay, derivations of these different kinds can then combine in simple and more complex ways to generate various familiar parts of the non-foundational content of morality, rights and justice. On this picture are prominent parts of morality, but they are not found fundamental. Their content is determined by reasons deriving from all of the foundations of morality. Our moral rights can be thought of as the moral standings we possess in virtue of a morally bounded allocation of freedom, where the moral boundaries consist in permissions of enforcement and or requirements of redress. Justice as is accommodating justice is accommodated as the quality that a social structure has when it is regulated by an authority as it morally should be. Whatever. Okay, so they're saying they can do all of this stuff. The other main departure from Ross is my account of how moral norms, both fundamental and derived, interact with each other. This extends beyond simply providing considerations of different weights that must be balanced against each other to include relationships of undermining through, through in which one moral consideration deprives another of the weight it would otherwise have had. All right, so this is one of these like perennial problems in these theories is that if you have competing um, duties, competing... Um, virtues how do you choose among them and so this person says they have a theory of that how do you choose the more important virtue how do you understand which uh duty you have to follow as opposed to others this person has a theory the book's th central chapters examine two main forms that undermining can take again distinguishing sub varieties of each the first is content undermining 
This is by name for a class of cases from which examples are often taken to support holism in the theory of practical reasons. Examples such as sadistic pleasure. Pleasure as a constitutant of welfare presumptively calls for a promotion, but when it is con when its content is misdirected towards others' suffering, the fitness of promoting it is undermined. Redeploying some of the ideas from Brentano's value theory, I argue that a theory with exception hedged principles at its foundation can explain this. We can explain the misdirection of the sadist pleasure by first invoking an application of the principle W to the suffering states that are the object of his pleasure and can draw on this to explain how the exception clause in W is satisfied when applied to his own sadistic pleasure state. It is in this way that the second worry about the structure of the theory, the worry that exception hedged principles cannot be foundational, is addressed. A Brentano style theory containing exception hedged principles can explain attributions of value without needing to be supplemented by any further more, further more fundamental principles and without any circularity. All right. So do you actually think that you can do this? Like that all the bad things in the world will exactly align to all the uh, exceptions that are built into the theory here? You know, I find that doubtful, but um, this person says they're pulling it off. I mean, I can guarantee you that all the philosophers, because this is in a uh, book symposium, are going to criticize the hell out of all these things the author is saying. But this is the thing. If they are getting close to pulling this off, it would be impressive. I just like, it's just like doubtful face. What's like the doubtful face here on Twitter? Like, hmm. Yeah, doubtful. This puts us in a position to explain when it is that we can, when it is that we can derive norms of fitness from the presumptive fitness relations that lie at the foundations of morality, namely when there is no content undermining. However, to derive normative reasons from the norms of fitness, several full further conditions must be satisfied. In order to have reason to respond to others' welfare with concern or their self-expression with respect, you must have the capacity to make the response. You must also satisfy a condition of personal relevance. The expression of condolences is a fit response to bereavement, but this is not enough to give you a reason to write a condolence letter to a bereaved person you have never met. A further, consider a further condition comes from what I, I call context undermining. An example is this. If you are acting as a trustee for some third party, the interests of your relatives are disqualified from being reasons for you to use the fund for their benefit. This is not because their interests have the wrong content to be fit promoted, fitly promoted, like those of the sadist. It is because they fail to qualify as reasons in this context. Here, the context is one in which you are exercising agency on behalf of the beneficiary of the trust, and the duties that attach to this role constrain the legitimate exercise of your agency, restricting the considerations that can qualify as reasons for and against the actions you perform. This agency-based kind of context undermining can be distinguished from other domain-based and meaning-based kinds. Again, doubtful face, but like, um, they say they can do it. Um, doubtful, but you know, you have to go see how they do it again. Maybe they're coming closer than we think they are. Let's see a bunch more of this we got. Okay. So we got a little bit more on this thing. They're just describing what they're doing, but like, how would you actually, you know, like the, it, what might be of interest here is that this agency based kind of context undermining will be distinguished from other domain based signs. So maybe this is an, uh, a novel way of going about this. Now, how well does it work? I don't know. But like how exactly did they pull this off M might be interesting. What results is a theory with the following overall structure. Morality's foundations are the norms of presumptive fitness, this WS, C plus, and C minus. So yeah, so like the respect and agency, uh, agency and uh, well-being, welfare, and then the collective stuffs. From these norms of fitness are, are derived where there is no content undermining, and from norms of fitness, reasons derived when there is no context undermining and conditions of capacity and personal relevance are satisfied. Deontic judgments, judgments about rightness and wrongness, and what ought all things considered to be done amount to verdicts about the overall bearing of our reasons and responses. So this is the kicker, as we were getting to it, that, that you can do all things uh, given this uh, reasoning path in terms of moral deontic theory. 
Then finally, eretetic judgments can be understood as verdicts about the quality of our responsiveness to those reasons, allowing us to generate helpful taxonomy of moral virtues, reflecting the relationships between the reasons to which the different virtues respond. So yeah, so okay, so you're coming down to exactly what you do, and then you can also slap a uh, like a, a score on top of like what you're doing. So it's not only do you get to decide what to do, you do, but then you get to score like a virtue score, like of how virtuous or how good that actually worked out. So how how uh, how well did you actually come? Um, so this is an error. Um, this is an error bar theory. So you've got your more your laws of um your rules, your deontic judgments, and then you've got error bars to show you how close or far you've deviated from the actual theory. Yeah. So that's what these uh verdicts are. So how far did you get it? Eretetic judgments can be understand of virtue about the quality of the responsiveness to these reasons. So how good were the reasons here that actually uh, corresponded to um, the deontic judgments? Okay. If a substantive moral theory such as this is to be convincing, it must give an account of the content of morality that is not only recognizable as corresponding to what we do on reflection, see as... C is morally important, but can also explain why it should matter to us as, as much as, and in terms, and in the way that it does. But doesn't that just mean that the system gets to create its own morality? Um, kind of. No one's saying how we actually put the error bars on this. Um, so basically, I have no idea how it's doing it. And so the idea that it's creating its own morality is not really, I don't think it, I don't think that's what they meant to say. I see where you're getting that though. But like what they, what they're doing here is, um, it's a little bit of a dodge, but it's, uh, it's not really a bad one. They're saying, allowing us to generate a helpful taxonomy of moral virtues. So what, it, what they're doing is we're going to say, look, we're going to look at how well all these things work out. And then we're going to have a taxonomy of moral virtue. And that's going to reflect the actual relationships afterwards. And then we can basically like uh, look at sort of like the rational history of how these things are applied. And then you can be judged against sort of the history here. Um based on how we have learned to uh, understand this stuff. So this is some sort of uh, scientific sort of uh, uh, look at how well we have applied the rules over time and how, according to how, how well it worked out. So it's not creating its own. It's sort of a sort of a scientific uh, superstructure that is like you're going to look at in a retrospect to understand what's going on. So... Because there's no other reason to ge to generate a taxonomy. Like the idea that you're going to generate a taxonomy makes no sense. Um, w why it would be helpful? Um, a taxonomy of moral virtues. <laughs> you're just going to throw off the uh, training uh, data. Is that what your goal is, Shane? Yeah. I, when I was in college, you know, you have to uh, sign up for like psych tests. I took psych 101. You had to go like volunteer, not volunteer, it was a requirement. And so I, I remember I was the first person they got for some psych thing. I said, but like maybe I'll screw up all your data. They said, no, 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 you can't screw up all our data. We account for like all sorts of weird things by like statistical methods. I was like, yeah, but you don't know me. Maybe I'm just weird. And they're like, no, don't worry about it. So Shane. Do you really think you're that crazy? Maybe you are. Will you really screw with, uh, screw with uh, all of the stuff? You'll get your own little taxonomy. The Shane McInnes uh, taxa of uh, morality. <sighs> yeah. All right. So where were we? So if it's to be convincing, it must give an account of the content morality that is not only recognizable as content as corresponding to what we do on reflection see it as morally important but can also explain why it should matter to us as much as and in the way that it does according to their own rules i i can't question my self-expression um yeah no they they said that you can question you shouldn't question it up to a point there were exceptions they had exceptions for uh self-expression so you could say if like self-expression was in some sort of bad way the one you couldn't uh, question was the collective action. Collective action was uh, 
always completely objectively judgment, uh, judged as uh, worthwhile or not worthwhile. Welfare, you could say they're hurting themselves, and expression, you could say they're expressing themselves poorly or something like that. So, yeah. Yeah, you form a cult, and then all of a sudden you're, they're going to have to... Uh, agree that either that your collective action is good because you are you know following some sort of higher purpose and then that would be perfectly acceptable so i think you're getting the point here is that this is where these sort of rule-based systems go very wrong is once it gets to the groups um it doesn't seem to work but yeah that's my opinion about these sorts of systems is that you get like you get yeah you, you got it, Shane. These are where the loopholes are. Like, and like I said, everything has loopholes in philosophy. Nothing is, like, settled. But, like, yeah, this is one of, like, when you deal with these things, th this is where these loopholes come in. You can see them coming. So. <laughs> like, how do you actually get, like, groups of things to work? Uh, court? It, it, this goes back to, like, the Philip K. Dick. The uh, three laws of, uh... Like in pop science, uh, the three laws of a uh, like a uh, AI, how, like you can't like break the laws, uh, like you can't harm a person. But once you like, you can get like ex yeah the three laws of robotics. That's right. But like once you like change your idea about what this counts as, all of a sudden you're still following the law, but it means something different now. And that's what happens once you find out. Once you realize that a collective action can be a thing of like group self-expression, then all of a sudden you it's, it's getting sort of hedgy, and you can form a cult. And all of a sudden, then like well, you've got like a grand purpose as a part of a cult, and your grand purpose is like well, that is unassailable. So it's like these are how yeah the Asimov. That's right. So. But this is, like, these are all rule-based systems, and they all go wrong in the exact same way very consistently. Like, theoretically, at least. Um, yeah. At least, every time I sit around reading this stuff. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I love Blade Runner. Um, I should go, uh... I didn't ever see the new one. I thought it was like they said it was okay. I love Blade Runner, the original. It's just wonderful. Excuse me. Yeah. Okay. So where were we? Okay. In the spirit, part two finishes by explaining how, through the following norms of 2049's. Oh, okay. Good. That's a good endorsement. I will keep that in mind. Through following norms of concern, respect, and cooperation, we can create and sustain three valuable kinds of interpersonal relationship, three valuable ways of connecting ourselves to each other. And this may be the payoff here. This might be really important information and uh, theory about how we do connect to other people. Through concern for each other, we forge a relationship in which the importance of others' welfare is shared. It matters not just to the other person, but to you too. Through respecting each other's self-expression, we share a relation, a recognition of the dignity we each have as independent recognizers of reasons who form our own decisions and opinions, and the equal status that is this, that this confers on us. And through cooperative relationships, we share our agency and our authorship of the actions we perform together. This, I suggest, supplies a non-derivational justification for taking morality seriously. A justification of its importance that does not derive that importance from a deeper set of normative foundations. And this is what I mean. This is the kicker down here. They think they have something new to add to the moral landscape. A non-derivative justification for taking morality seriously. So that means there is a fundamental thought that morality has to be taken seriously here. So this is like why you might want to do a system like this is because you get something... Uh, independent objective to take morality seriously but i mean the real worry is that the history of these theories is of course people trying to get this sort of result because it also justifies you know maybe their religious beliefs that more their morality is important and so they've done all of this work to go justify something that they were just already believed because they you know they got it from whatever their religion or their community or whatever it is but you know if they got this, good for them. Okay. 
Finally, part three offers three extended applications of the theory discussing three contentious types of actions for which reasons of a concern, respect, and cooperation seem to pull in different directions. These are respectively actions of paternalism, in which a person's self-expression is restricted for her own benefit, actions of using one person as a means of benefiting another, and the actions we take as consumers participating in markets that have bad as well as good effects, which I see as an important application of reasons of cooperation. The emphasis in these three chapters is on showing how the materials provided earlier in the book allow us to say something more illuminating than simply that we must balance reasons from these three sources against each other. A Rossian theory does not give you principles telling you what verdict to reach in particular cases, but I try to show that it can still give us useful guidance by clarifying which considerations are important and how to think about the relationship between them. As will be clear from this description, Concern, Respect, and Cooperation is an ambitious book. In trying to present an overall moral theory within a book of readable length, it attempts to cover a lot of ground in a short space, and there is much room for supplying further detail. What, whether that is worth pursuing depends on the strength of the overall structure set out so far. To assess that, some serious stress testing is called for. I am grateful to my fellow symposiasts for their willingness to take this on. Okay, so but this is the thing. Like I said earlier, person knows what they're up to. They seem to be a competent, uh, they're not like overshooting what they think they're doing. They know it's ambitious and they know that they're going to have to like, a, there's a lot of stuff that they're covering here and they think they're like, all right, but I think I've got the good enough structure that like I'm getting good results and that's why people should, you know, not ignore the rough patches, but be willing to uh, go through the rough bits because the uh, rough bits, because the uh, the end goal is worth it. When the apocalypse comes, I will remember this for when I set up my kingdom. Yeah, I'm not living anywhere where you're in charge, Shane. Good night, Uh Thank you for being here. Um, thanks for the suggestion earlier on uh, reading on up on purse, and thanks for the bits. I appreciate it. Um, be well. Yeah, actually, no, that's not true, because uh, as long as I get, like, a nice cushy job, I'd definitely live wherever you're ruling. But, like, this is why I don't trust these people, because there seems to be too many holes, and you have to be too too much goodwill in the uh, theory to um, stick with this stuff. You have to, like, assume the people that are, like, interpreting it in a good way. And uh, knowing people, I don't think... Uh, people are when they get power they're willing to do that yeah thank you shane but like this is the thing shane knows what he's talking about in terms of history and how like laws are ab abused and so this is the sort of thing that i think is worrying shane and is worrying me is that this sort of thing requires people to be good to begin with and then this can like sort of direct their action but if you're not good to begin with this is not going to do crap like no one's they're just gonna abuse it um it's not that uh there's too much going on here that worries me about this stuff. But I mean, that's again, who am I to criticize a moral philosopher? I don't do moral philosophy. I do like, like arcane, like other philosophy, but like maybe I don't get enough done. And like this person's actually trying to say, well, this is how we should be looking at the world. I don't know. But yeah. Uh, I had an old roommate when I was in college actually um, and he was saying when he gets in power and it, this wasn't directed at me we were just talking about something else and uh, he says the first thing I'm going to do when I get power is I'm going to murder all the lawyers and philosophers and I was like you know I think that's exactly what dictators do usually <laughs> like that's pretty typical because <laughs> uh, like you, they, people get called out because you can use this sort of thing like oh wow this is exactly what uh, our moral theory says to do um, I'm showing concern and respect and cooperation for the people but of course which people count and this sort of thing going back in time that's pretty accurate I don't know much history but I know a few things and this is one of the ones that I know it's like this is it's not so hard to uh, abuse laws so Yeah, I mean, this is not like laws are how th certain things are governed, but a lot of times that's uh, how things actually get done in the world. It's very messy. So, 
and I'm always worried about these theories, they look like they exist in a cleaner world than I live. Because like the idea that you can apply fitness, as you were commenting, the idea that you can apply fitness, like things fit together a certain way. <sighs> in what world do things fit neatly ever? I, I don't know where like that sort of concept, like it's too clean. Like how do things... uh are going to do like how, how's that all going to work together it doesn't make sense to me um so yeah so okay yeah see here's the fit and called for so the but the responses to welfare that are fit or called for what are the fit and called for um if humanity only made objective decisions this model would be fine yeah exactly we're not we don't follow these rules like robots. And that was kind of the point of uh, when I brought that up, the the three laws of robotics or whatever, that it seems like it would work for robots. But as soon as like you, they get a little bit more human, they get anything out of it. It stops working anymore because then the laws can be interpreted as people see fit and as people see fit or what they think they're called for is not what the original or whatever the, the point was to begin with. That's just not how anything happens. Okay. So do we have anything more to uh, say about this? And in some sense, this is why I actually circled this earlier. This is the original Ross that was not specific enough. We have a prima facie duty to promote others' welfare. So this is why I kind of like this. This is massively more simplistic, but it, because of that, it is also much harder to, to screw around with. The fact that it's like we have a prime, we should promote others' welfare. That's really hard. That's even though it's simplistic and you can't get any specifics out of it, it's also harder to uh, fight against because of that reason. And so, in some sense, the simpler thing in this case is it might still be better than getting overly specific. But anything that's overly specific can, of course, be more is more manipulable. This is harder to manipulate. You'd be like, if someone's doing something bad, you're like, you are not promoting their welfare. And that is an immediate uh, condemnation of people acting badly. But like if you say, well, I'm not doing this or I'm doing that or I'm doing some little, little thing like it's very specific, then you get caught up in the details. And then once you're caught up in the details, people can do whatever they want. And this is the delay tack. It delay tactic this is the like uh, postpone you know argue like unimportant details all the things that like you know assholes do just to do whatever they want because if you have enough money and lawyers and whatever you can just keep bringing up bullshit and uh, get away with it in uh, modern America okay cool so yeah any Last comments on this, because, like, I'm overheating. It's getting to be, like, you know, back to 90 degrees in this room. So, if that is all, let me know. I will wish you a all a fantastic night. Shane says, I always love pointing out that Yahweh gave the Israelites ten rules, and they had to write five books of scriptures to clarify. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Like, um... That's a great story for that reason. 